What were you talking about on the stream with time? Are you made of time? If I remembered half the things I said on stream, uh, someday someone's going to make a model of all of it, and it's going to come back to haunt me. Someday soon? Yeah, probably. Would that be exciting to you or sad that there's a George Hotz model? I mean, the question is when the George Hotz model is better than George Hotz. Like, I am declining, and the model is growing. So. What is the metric by which you measure better or worse in that? If you're competing with yourself... Maybe you can just play a game where you have the George Hotz answer and the George Hotz model answer and ask which people prefer. People close to you or strangers? Either one. It will hurt more when it's people close to me, but both will be overtaken by the George Hotz model. <laughs> It'd be quite painful, right? Loved ones, family members would rather have the model over for Thanksgiving than you. Yeah. Or like significant others would rather sext... <laughs> <laughs> with the uh, with the large language model version of you. Especially when it's fine-tuned to their preferences. It, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what we're doing in a relationship, right? We're just fine-tuning ourselves, but we're inefficient with it because we're selfish and greedy and so on. A language models can fine-tune more efficiently, more selflessly. There's a Star Trek Voyager episode where, uh, you know, Catherine Janeway, lost in the Delta Quadrant, makes herself a lover on the holodeck. Mm -hmm. And um, the lover falls asleep uh, on her arm and he snores a little bit. And, you know, Janeway edits the program to remove that. And then, of course, the realization is, wait, this person's terrible. It is actually all their uh, nuances and quirks and slight annoyances that, that make this relationship worthwhile. But I don't think we're going to realize that until it's too late. Well, uh, I think a large language model could incorporate the... The flaws uh, and the quirks and all that kind of stuff. Just the perfect amount of quirks and yeah. flora, flaws to make you charming without crossing the line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's probably a good, like, approximation of the, like, the percent of time the language model should be uh, cranky or uh, an asshole yeah. or jealous or all this kind of stuff. And of course it can and it will, but all that difficulty at that point is artificial. There's no more real difficulty. Okay, what's the difference between real and artificial? Artificial difficulty is difficulty that's like constructed or could be turned off with a knob. Mm -hmm. Real difficulty is like you're in the woods and you gotta survive. So if something can not be turned off with a knob, it's real. Yeah, I think so. Or, I mean, you can't get out of this by smashing the knob with a hammer. I mean, maybe you kind of can, you know, uh, into the wild when, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Alexander Supertramp, he wants to explore something that's never been explored before. But it's mm -hmm. the 90s, everything's been explored. So he's like, well, I'm just not gonna bring a map. Yeah. I mean, no, you're, you're not exploring. You should have brought a map, dude, you died. There was a bridge a mile from where you were camping. How does that connect to the metaphor of the knob? By not bringing the map, you didn't become an explorer. You just smashed the thing. Yeah. Yeah. The, art, the difficulty is still artificial. You failed before you started. What if we just don't have access to the knob? Well, that maybe is even scarier, right? Like we already exist in a world of nature and nature has been fine-tuned over billions of years yeah. um, to uh, have uh, humans build something and then throw the knob away in some grand romantic gesture is horrifying. 